Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Border State Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and comment below. Before further ado, I've been I've been promoting this interview for a long time now. I do have, in fact, Wendy Deal on my show. How are you doing, Wendy? I, I couldn't believe that you... I, I thought that this was going to be a miss because it was 531. And I was like, oh, my God, what's happening? But how are you? I'm good, and thank you for inviting me on your show. I appreciate it. I'm telling you, everybody watching this is going to appreciate hearing from you. Now, I did um, have some, you know, uniquely cliche, not, not, not cliche, actually. I don't ask generally cliche questions, but before I do that, I got to tell you, um, your uh, late husband um, shaped my life in his music and in the way he was, especially with hearing aid, um, somebody that humble to um, realize that, um, you know, with the talent that surrounded him and himself, that he could do his part in helping people out. So, I mean, um, well, first of all, tell us how you met Ronnie. Um, well, I came over to America and I was doing some stuff, some movie stuff. Uh, and in between that, I needed to make some money. So I worked at the Rainbow uh, in on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, Richie came in. They had just uh, formed Rainbow. Richie Blackmore's was Rainbow. Yeah. Uh, they had uh, they had recorded it, but they had not gone touring yet. And they came into the Rainbow. I knew Richie because I knew him and his wife and everybody. I'd known them for years in England. And um, so they were having a party afterwards, and they invited me to go up to their Hollywood Hills uh, house. And I met Ronnie up there, and they were kept on kind of pushing him towards me. I said, oh, he's way too short for me. Uh, anyway, um, we uh, we went, we went all went for breakfast about five of us after about 5 a.m. in the morning. And then he said, do you want to go for a drive up to Malibu? And I said, okay. We went up and watched the sunrise and started dating. And we dated for a couple of weeks. And then he went on the road. And I thought, well, that was the end of it. And then he called me and said, uh, quit your job and come and join me. I said, well, I can't do that. I'll come for a couple of weeks. And um, I went for a couple of weeks, which ended up to be the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. You know what? This is so amazing how you brought up the fact that you thought, well, he's too short for me because, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, it's a, it's, yep. it's a, it's a question that people, I uh, think, think of, but they're too afraid to ask, but I'm not afraid to ask. Did Ronnie have any issues with um, his physical height? He was such a big man, obviously, in, and that's what matters, spirituality and just who you are. But did he have any he kind to, of um, issues with uh, that? Or, no? He used to get annoyed sometimes when people would say something about his height and not his music. But yeah. if you look at all the people, all the really good singers, okay, Lou mm -hmm. Graham, Klaus Mines, Bruce Dickinson, Stevie Marriott, they're all small with big voices. Yeah, that that is true, and even movie stars, you because they're yeah, yeah, on the and like screen. Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise is I think five foot four or something. Is yeah. that tall? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just yeah, no, I think so. <laughs> so yeah, so that answers that. I mean, he's very very strong minded person. Now, I'm just gonna just get into one of my questions that I think that a lot of people are going to be interested in. Um, in relation to these days and the political climate that we've unfortunately found ourselves in, especially in the last five years, and especially what happened over the weekend, what would Ronnie's thoughts be on that? Would he be just shocked at how things bad, how bad things have gotten, or did he not pay attention to that sort of thing? Oh, he paid attention. He would be very upset about everything, the way things are going now, um, uh, especially violence. Ronnie was, was always against violence especially against violence for women. I mean, he always mm. he did a lot for women. Um, no, he would have been, I, I think he would have been really devastated the way that the world is going right now. Yeah, it's just, um, I, I'm just as shocked. So um, question I'm not sure how many times you've been asked, but maybe not too many so that you'll answer it. <laughs> um, would Ronnie have a favorite guitarist uh, that he played with either in Rainbow, Dio, in any genre would he play music that he actually told you, you know what, this is my favorite for this reason, personality, oh, yeah, technique? Tony Iommi. He said really? he was the richest. He was the most amazing person to play with because he had to really keep up to keep up with Tony. And to this is why, Ronnie, you know, I'm really glad that 
the one thing that happened before Ronnie passed away that he got to get back with the Fabs. Um, that was his favorite uh, bunch of musicians to play with because he said they were all such professionals and everybody had to really keep up with each other to to make it happen. And they were all such such a tight, tight t- together. And I, I was really, really happy that they, uh, all the bad things were, were in the past had gone and they were all back being friends and playing together because that was, that was Ronnie. Ronnie loved playing with all the other guitarists, but he always said, you know, that, that they were all different. Like Richie was a great guitar player, but he said that Tony was just such an amazing riff player that he would come up with a riff just more and more and more and just out of nowhere. Yeah, and the funny thing, well, it's not funny, but he had that handicap, Richie, or Tony did. Oh, yeah. um, he, bit, mm. he bit his finger off. No, I don't, he didn't bit his finger off, but he had that, that accident where he lost the, a bit of the, yep. his index finger. So he was playing with his the... finger, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, he was uh, working as a meat cutter and uh, he sliced the top of his finger off. And uh, he always had these uh, these um, uh, like plastic tips that he would put on. Yeah. And that's exactly what formed the Black Sabbath um, sound because they had to tune down a bit because he uh, because of his finger. And that, that made the Black Sabbath sound. So you're, you're are you, so I mean, I didn't know that. So you're saying the thimble or whatever they put on uh, Tony's tip of his finger because when it hit the string, maybe it was made out of a um, metal, that they had to tune down just to, for that reason, really? They had the, the sound changed because of his finger. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Wow. Didn't know that. I did not know that, Johnny Carson. And that became the sound of Black Sabbath. Wow, isn't that something? Um, mm-hmm. What do you think um, Ronnie would be? He would, like, t- let's say today you, you spoke with Ronnie, let's say um, telepathic or whatever. What would he want to be remembered most of? Would it be his music? Um, things like maybe his love for his family? Um, what would he want to be remembered by? His humanity uh, for people. I think um, his love of people, his love of his fans. Uh, he loved his fans more than anything. The music was always written for his fans. He performed for his fans. He always said, you know, I, I, I'll sign everybody's autograph. I'll do what they want because I would not live the lifestyle I did if it wasn't for these people. And they are so loyal and so loving. And, and the stories they would give to him and he would feel so good that, you know, people would listen to his music, listen to his lyrics and, and, and come away getting what he wrote and just feeling good for themselves because he always wrote music about follow your dreams never give up always Mm -hmm. follow your dreams and don't let anyone put you down because you're too short too fat too old too young too or whatever just follow your dreams and and don't let people put you down right um and when rapey when ronnie found out he was sick with cancer how was his faith at that time in his life and um did it obviously gradually grow more or did was he always a faithful person in his spirituality, I guess I would ask? Well, he was an altar boy. He was raised in a very Italian Catholic family. Um, he believed in something. Um, yeah, me too. No, yeah, he, he, he didn't really have a faith. Uh, he believed there was something there and that you had to be a really good person in this life so that you could come back as a better person and in the end get it right and become the ultimate being which i believe ronnie got it right yeah um, i believe go ahead no I, I i did when he was in the hospital i did get a priest for him to give him the last rites not by ronnie's request but by my request mm-hmm. yeah see that's the way i've grown up too um <clears throat> i grew up uh, catholic but I do believe from my own life experiences that I don't think that there's one, let's say religion, that's right and one that's wrong. I think if you're a good mm-hmm. person, and I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of near-death experience videos and stuff, and people are told when they have their experience that their goal is to go back and to finish business and come back. Mm-hmm. And if it's your time, it's mm-hmm. your time. If not, you go back. So it's a form of reincarnation, which is funny that the Absolutely. Catholic religion frowns mm-hmm. upon. Exactly, exactly. But we both believe that very strongly. I mean, plants, they die and then they come back next year. You know, why shouldn't that happen to human beings too? Exactly. Um, did you have, or do you have a famous um, um, 
Ronnie written song or album? I mean, I, I you probably mentioned this a million times, but uh, let's go for a million and one. <laughs> well, Ronnie wrote Rainbow Eyes about me, so it has to be my favorite song. <laughs> okay, I can. Even, even though I love Stargazer, I love Gates of Babylon, I love those kind of songs. Um, I love like Don't Talk to Strangers. I love, love that Ryan. song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, speaking of a couple of those songs, um, you, I sent you a, a question and I was going to ask you and you said it was fair to ask, you'll answer it or you won't. Um, in relation to, say, Viv Campbell, um, as I know and you know, a lot of people um, do things, they say things that um, in hindsight we regret. I'm not saying you, I'm not saying Viv. It, what I'm saying is, is there a chance after all these years that um, you would have, I don't know about a reconciliation where you'd have a big uh, meet and greet buffet, but if you were to see him, say, in an airport, would you guys be able to approach each other? Or No. No, no. okay, so there's too much. Too many lies were told, too many lies about things that put him money down, not only things he said, but other lies, you know, oh. like he got $100 a week, things like that. It was Ronnie was never a cheap person. And mm -hmm. Vivian Campbell owned a Ferrari while he was in Dio. I don't know how he bought that for a hundred dollars a week. So you know, yeah. I, I just there was just too many things have gone down. And after Ronnie passed away, things have gone down, and I, I just can't. I yeah, he's not okay. in my life. Okay, well, I appreciate your answer, and I appreciate um, you know, it's rather you being honest than um, you know, mm -hmm. not. So I appreciate that, and the viewers do appreciate that too. Um, now, the reason I think I got this interview, um, I recently interviewed Doug Aldrich, very good friend of yours. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. he told me he was delighted and he told some funny stories um, at the event this year. Some funny stories. Um, every year that you have the event, um, are you thinking of new people during the course of the year? You know what? He was a part of Ronnie and Maya's life. We should invite that person. Do you do that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we, we invite whoever wants to come, you know. I mean, everybody I is welcome. Everyone's welcome. Well, I want to go. Well, come. Well, you're welcome. Everyone's welcome. We uh we just love it that people are still here keeping Ronnie's music and his memory alive and raising money for, for cancer research and education. You know, we raised on the last one, we raised $80,000, and, and we're supporting Dr. Wong, which, uh, if you saw the, the video of, of aftermath of, of our concert, uh, we presented him with another $25,000 on stage. We present him with $25,000 almost twice a year. Um, to uh, He's working on a research room at UCLA uh, with a saliva test, which mm -hmm. would um, give you... He wants to actually get it where... It's in, in, in TVS or somewhere you could just go in and buy the test and do it at home and find out very early detection if you have cancer or not. And he Would uses saliva be... because, yeah, the that... saliva doesn't have to be refrigerated and blood does. So it would be that, are you saying that the test would determine uh, the white and red blood cell levels or no, something different? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. you, the, the saliva test now, he was working on, he's working on it for us for only Pacific cancers, which is um, stomach cancer, gastric cancers, and pancreatic cancer, which are killers, because you don't really know you've got them until it's too late. So this is what he's working on very early, and we've been supporting him with that. But then uh, the government came in and gave him a large grant to switch it to lung cancer. So mm. he, I think the lung cancer test might come up uh, maybe this year. Uh, FDA may approve it for that. No, but he's still wow. working on the one for us for the pancreatic and the uh, stomach cancers. Wow. Um, I won't keep you much longer. I do appreciate your time. You're a busy woman. Um, I don't know if you got that question that I sent Paula, but i um, asking you, is there something about Ronnie James Dio that you want to say now that you've never told about him that's so unique <laughs> that people are going to say that's not true? Oh, I don't know if there's anything I've never told about him. Um, he got a scholarship at Juilliard, which he doesn't want. Uh, he was a big giant and Yankee fan. Right. Uh, he, he wrote his songs while he was listening to them. Um, I don't know what else. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> when he was on stage and he wasn't having stage clothes made or, or interview clothes made, he did work. He would shop at Walmart. <laughs> what? <laughs> that, 
Maybe nobody knows that. He'd buy George, the brand George. I don't know what brand he bought. He I bought think that's a Walmart brand. Oh, a bunch of sweats and things. And one time we were at, at a Walmart and uh, a fan came out and goes, I can't believe you're shopping at Walmart. <laughs> Did he use coupons? No. No, no, <laughs> no. Oh, my goodness. Did he have a favorite Canadian band or a celebrity or anybody that you would think of? Uh, he liked the band Gua. Um he liked Tool very much. Uh, obviously, he was a Beatles fan, a Zeppelin fan. Um, he was, uh, uh, he loved opera singers. Oh, um, really? Oh, yeah. He was very, um, uh, and also, uh, let's see, Bach and Beethoven. He loved it. He mm -hmm. thought that Beethoven was a rock star because he yeah. was crashing music and stuff. He said, oh, he, he was definitely a metal person before metal was invented. Is it um, fair to say he liked Ingve Malmsteen? I don't know this kind of answer, so I'm just asking because because Ingve's music is based on classical. Well, I think it is. Um, well, he obviously Richie Blackmore's uh, music is based on classical. That's the fair enough. Why yeah, he was in Rainbow in the first place was because yep. they both loved classical music. You know, they wrote you know 16th century green sleeves, which uh, right. was taken from the classic song. Right. Well, like I said, this has been an honor. Um, I got two cliche questions, standard questions, not cliche, standard. Um, mm -hmm. What's your favorite Canadian band? Do you have one, musician? What band? Mm, let's see. Big Purple. Okay, I don't think they're Canadian, but they are now. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pull them over. <laughs> we're gonna pull them over. Um, a Canadian band. Okay, give me a Canadian band. How about um. Oh, what's the band that uh, what Sam's working with? Paul and Dexter. Oh, um, Little River Band. All right, we'll go with that one. I'm not sure if they're Canadian <laughs> either, but they're bringing them they over. Are uh, they, they are Canadian. They are Canadian. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, well, Canadian know. band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, what about Lover Boy? Lover Boy's good, yeah, yeah. What about uh, what's the band? Oh, I'm trying to think of. I can't think of his name right BTO, now. BTO um, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Guess who? Say again. Say again. Guess who? Bachman Turner Overdrive. Brian Adams. No. no. Rush. No. Rush. Everybody yes. says Rush. Rush. Thank God you didn't Rush. on the first try because everybody says it, and I'm like, oh, except Rush, because <laughs> we have a lot of good <laughs> bands too. Um, yeah, of course you do. I have you... my yeah my uh my very good friend who is um uh married to our PR person Chip Rogieri she's Canadian does all my makeup oh yeah I've makeup. worked with Chip well I mean I, I mean he's helped me with some uh, interviews this is I mean great guy Chip everybody had to go to Chipster PR but last question what is the opposite yes. of unsubscribe <laughs> of unsubscribe. Hmm. Just the opposite. Subscribe. Everybody does is the great Wendy Deal, widow of the great Ronnie James Deal, and, and subscribe to this channel. And that's why you get these great interviews. Once again, Wendy, I'd like to thank you, your daughter, for helping set up the camera, and Paul mm -hmm. for setting up the interview. Thank you all. You did not ask me about Sharon. Oh, I'm going to. I forgot about that. Okay, so <laughs> so since you're a rock star in your own right, and um, you're um, a very influential behind Ronnie's success, we all know that. Um, have you ever been compared to uh, Miss Osborne, uh, Ozzy's wife, in the same vein? Let me tell you that in the eighties, only Sharon and I were the only female managers. We had to fight our way through men telling us we didn't know what we were doing. I listen. We had two different ways of doing it. I listened very carefully to what the men said and said sweetly, thank you very much for helping me, and then did what I wanted to. Sharon just told him to F off. And that was the two differences between us. Um, I've known Sharon for years and years. I knew her before in England years ago. Um, we don't we don't walk in the same circles, but if I see Sharon, we say hi, we see each other um, occasionally. But uh, we, we're not in the same circles. But she did an amazing job uh, and, and has led the way, along with I hope I have. 
to, to let other women become women managers because they're very good at managing, very good women managers. There's a lot now, and I'm so glad we see them. Absolutely. Well, there's one you forgot. There was a third one. There was the one that um, replaced Ian and Spinal Tap. Remember? Remember the girlfriend of um, of the singer? And this is Spinal Tap. Remember they canned Ian and she became the manager for a while? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I don't yes. think she was on the same level as you and Sharon. So. No, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks so much, Wendy. I appreciate it. No, thank you so much, Janice. I appreciate it. Anytime you want me on, let me know and I'll be there. Thanks a lot.